Mo friends, I just finished a new diorama, uh, that one, and as expected, there was a lot of leftovers from that project. And usually, when I'm done with the project and I'm editing the video, I stay away from the studio for two or three days. So the other day, I was quite surprised when I went there, and I was met with a lot of mess. Nani? And there was even more on the workbench. But I knew that there were some useful leftovers, namely the turret from the Tamiya kit, and even more importantly, two figures. Not every project produces a lot of leftovers, but this was one of the lucky occasions. So you probably know what that means. We're making another small vignette. I started with the turret assembly, because in this scene, it's gonna be kinda, sorta, the main protagonist. When I compare it with the Bronco one from the previous model, it has significantly fewer parts, but also a lot of details are very simplified. There's always some room for basic improvements. You know, removing large bolts, improving the armor texture, and adding new bolts punch from a sheet of styrene. Improving the steel texture is a simple and enjoyable technique, and it greatly enhances the look of pretty much every armor model. Because the hatch is pretty big and I wanted to leave it open, there would be a ton of empty space. My solution, although not perfect, was scavenging the breach details from the other Valentine kit. I know it's an absolute unit of a breach for such a small turret, but for the purposes of this vignette, it's much better than nothing. I also had a few leftover photo edge details from Voyager, and these also helped to improve the overall level of detail. Not by much, but again, at least something. These palette cleanser projects are awesome because you don't have to be very serious about everything all the time. Figures also play a very important role in this scene. My initial plan was to use two Soviet tankers, but the size difference between the Alpine and Panzer art figures was very noticeable. So ultimately, I decided to just go with the Alpine tank commander. That actually brings us to the initial composition using blocks of styrofoam. Vignettes usually tell a simple story in a very small area. As such, I always start with a reasonable size and then I can make it smaller if needed. That's why working with styrofoam and a hot wire cutter is so awesome if you're into miniature sceneries. It just opens up so many possibilities for you. Because this scene is gonna have two main levels, I've cut the foam brick in half. The bottom will be the creek, while the upper half will be a creek bank. The only inefficient part of this process is carving irregular shapes. Knives don't do a great job, but I already bought a handheld wire cutter for this very purpose. Okay, this was my initial draft. An old valentine turret sunken in a creek, and a comrade tank commander looking into the distance. And here's the same composition, but after a few hours of tinkering and small adjustments. Now we can move on to the fun stuff, creating the actual landscape. Most of the time, I like to start with a layer of acrylic texture paste from AK, which anchors the VMS smart mud clay, but this base was already textured enough from all the cutting and carving, so the smart mud was rather easy to apply. It was also quite efficient around the tree, and I could use the clay to firmly secure it in place. All heavy objects should be firmly pressed into the ground, and because this scene is so simple, it was just the figure and the blown off turret. And while the clay was still soft, I added various pebbles from my backyard, trademark, into the creek bed. Not all creeks have large rocks in them, but it's definitely a nice detail. This is the initial, but very important step. If you'd like some VMS clay as well, you can get it with my discount codes and help me out with your purchases, links in the description. Next up, we have to laminate the sides. For simple bases like this, I like to use 0.6mm oak veneer. I used it on the previous diorama as well. When it comes to more complex sceneries, where buildings are part of the landscape for example, I like the 0.4mm variant because it's more discreet. Double-sided tape is the quickest way of attaching it, and so far it's proven to be quite reliable. 
Note how I'm leaving some protruding veneer in all directions. That's because it's much easier to cut it precisely once it's glued to the diorama. The upper edges are very important for the overall presentation of the scene. I can easily create additional terrain features that are nicely defined by the durable wooden sides. And the reason for applying the wood so early in the process? Well, it's because I can blend the edges with the groundwork using the VMS clay. In my opinion, the base looks much better when it has no visible edges. Now we have an absolutely perfect base, ready for some detailed work and realistic textures. Let's start with the tree. Here I added a bunch of twigs cosplaying as roots. Not the best result, but I'll try to improve it with Magic Sculpt 2 part buddy. I covered the entire tree with it, except the broken part. Adding tree bark with some kind of putty is a standard procedure for me, but this is the first time I'm using Magic Sculpt for the job. I usually like to work with Tamiya or Green Stuff epoxies, but let me tell you, the soft, almost foamy quality of this one makes it perfect for the task. I tried to improve the overall shape of the roots with a bit of sculpting, and later I realized that I could have sculpted them entirely from scratch. Well, I mean, at least we learn when we don't succeed, right? Anyway, adding the heavy bark texture is always fun, and even though the original bark on the twig was very nice, I still prefer to add my own. A bit of cleanup with a brush and tap water, and we can move on to the next step. The ground in this scene will have two different textures. Although I haven't used the AK texture paste in the initial layer, I decided to use it now. It can seal the porous surface of the VMS clay, and if we work swiftly, we can use it as an adhesive for loose texture. The creek bed should be rather smooth, and for this effect, I chose very fine sand from Modeler's World. It feels like powder when you touch it, but trust me, it has some volume. I also wanted more pebbles near the shore, and because I'm going to paint everything, I wasn't bothered by the actual material. The wet acrylic paste can't hold all this volume in place on its own, so I dripped the surface with alcohol, and once it was fully saturated, diluted PVA glue was added in generous amounts. The wet surface will distribute it evenly and soak it up like a sponge. The upper section looks like your ordinary groundwork. As such, real earth from my garden, trademark, was applied instead of fine sand. I repeated the same procedure with alcohol and PVA glue, and because the entire base was completely soaked from top to bottom, I left it to dry overnight. Once everything was rock hard the next morning, I could proceed to the final stage of construction, adding some initial vegetation. This was just about gluing various lengths of static grass with the aid of a static grass applicator. You don't usually find too much grass in forests. Various types of small plants are the main occupants, so most of the grass that I'm applying just acts as a filler of sorts. You'll see a bit later. I also added a bunch of photo edge weeds, but the majority of vegetation will be made from paper plants. Those are, however, easier to apply individually once the ground is painted. Basically, I added everything that could be painted comfortably as a part of the scene. So, let's prepare the base for painting, by staining the sides and masking the veneer. I talked about my misadventures with this approach in the previous video, because this is just my second attempt with this type of finish. Until now, I painted all my bases black for a neutral, unassuming finish. But this slightly textured, semi-glossy, warm look has quickly grown on me. But we don't want to spray anything on that sweet finish now, do we? So, it's important to carefully mask the wooden sides. Luckily, there's a very quick and precise method. You just need a fresh hobby blade, and then you just carefully trace the contours of the terrain, working as close to the surface as possible. So, let's move next door to my painting workbench. Okay, sweet. Now, take a guess what's gonna come first. That's right, dark brown primer. Not only is it essential for the post-shaded approach, but it also plays an important role with the epoxy water. Dry earth, even though it has been saturated with white glue before, 
would start soaking up the resin, but that's not gonna be the case if the ground is primed. People always say something about grass being green or, or whatever, and it's certainly the case here. I like it when the vegetation in my dioramas is vivid, at least in most cases, but here I decided to push it to another level. I actually paid attention when I was biking through the forest and watched how bright the greenery is. In a lot of cases, it's almost neon green-like color, but that might be a bit too much for our artistic purposes. Needless to say, it's always fun to post-shade artificial grass, and watching it take shape and volume is very satisfying. I always spray the groundwork as the second step, because I can quickly fix all the green overspray. Because I applied two different textures, I also made sure to paint it in two different tones. Dark one for the bottom of the creek and a lighter one for the forested bank. However, forest ground is usually quite dark because of the shadows cast by trees and also the moisture retained by all the plant life. But we'll adjust that with enamel effects. It's quite impressive how transformative the process can be and that's just the very rough base coat applied with an airbrush. And because the remaining techniques are gonna be more precise, I won't need the masking tape anymore. In fact, seeing the veneer will make it easier for me to strike a visual balance between the wooden sides and the scenery. Earth colored enamel washes are a very relaxing step for me. It took me a while to find an efficient workflow and I'll be honest, there's a lot of back and forth. I don't know an exact step-by-step -step formula, but if I were to simplify it as much as possible, it would be dark washes around grass and plants, medium and light tones towards the open areas, some additional dark washes around stones, details and indentations in the ground, and finally, a gentle dry brush with a light dry tone. Then it's just about finding the right color balance depending on what color your ground should be. Again, forest ground is usually on the darker side. Take a look at these two examples where I'm totally posing on purpose as color reference, but you see what I mean. So that's what we're trying to achieve tonight. Also, a quick heavy wash goes a very long way on the tree bark when the base coat is a good one. But as you'll see, not everything turns out excellent on the first try. Painting rocks is another fun exercise, as these can be finished rather quickly and the results are very good. Maybe even better than the raw unpainted ones, because now we can introduce some artificial shadows and volumes, making them look more authentic in this smaller scale. Everything is achieved with wet blending, which means applying diluted acrylic paints on top of each other before they dry. Smaller pebbles usually don't require such a meticulous treatment, so painting them in different grayish tones is more than enough. And what I'm really proud of is the exposed fresh wood on the tree. After looking at a few references, I was quite surprised that skin tones work much better for this effect, compared to my usual sandy colors. But let me tell you, even though I was ready to start planting additional vegetation, I didn't like the look of the scene. The tree had a very similar color palette to the ground, and the forest floor didn't look dark and busy enough. So I went back and did some adjustments. A heavy black acrylic wash over the entire tree bark to make it significantly darker. And then some controlled gray tones on the protruding parts. Dry brushing would have worked, but I find more control when I'm applying it selectively with an unloaded wet brush. Also, the forest floor is always littered with dead plants and leaves. I used small pieces of dried sea balls from AK and sprinkled them deliberately over the ground. This immediately made a huge difference, although it looked more like a dry meadow at this point. I added a little bit of leaf scatter made from actual crushed dry leaves and glued it all in place with gravel and sand fixer. I did some post shading as well with dark yellow because I wanted to add more vibrancy to the ground and to enhance the forested look added a bunch of dried oak leaves applied individually with a small amount of PVA glue. These also come from AK and are one of the best purchases a diorama modeler can make. You can get anything from AK if you use my affiliate link in the video description and use a discount code as well. It'll help me out. 
And just like before, a few controlled enamel washes will give it a more unified and authentic look. Much better now, my friends. Sometimes it's good to step back and get some fresh ideas before continuing with your work. Tree bark is often very desaturated, but don't worry. You can have your tree in full monochrome, but moss will give it a splash of fresh color. There's a ton of moss growing in the forest, so I wasn't shy with the application. What I like the most about it is how you can go to town with paints. You can go as vivid as you want, but the most important step is the initial color, which has to be some kind of dark brown. Also, each layer has to be applied wet, because this way, the colors will seep into each other, creating very natural looking transitions. It takes quite a while to dry, and when it does, the overall tone becomes much more subdued, so don't worry if it looks quite toxic while the paints are still wet. At this stage, I also painted all the photo-etched plants. The color palette was very similar, as well as the actual process. I started with a dark brown for the stalks, and then painted the leaves with the same greens used just moments ago. Darker green as the initial layer, and a vibrant frog green for the highlight. Some wooden highlights on the branches gave them a more three-dimensional look. Quite simple and fast. Let's now completely transform the scene with paper plants. So far I wasn't very satisfied with my results in previous dioramas, so I usually avoided them. But it was thanks to this scene that I finally found a workflow that gives me the exact results I always wanted. The key is to completely ignore the green color of the paper. You might as well spray the entire sheet with a black brown Tamiya paint, which is exactly what I started doing during this project. Then it's about shaping the plant with tweezers the usual way and gluing it into the scene with a drop of undiluted PVA. I find it much easier to apply the actual colors once it's placed on the ground, because I have a much better idea about where lights and shadows should be, and it's also easier to find the right color balance. Some of these can be quite complex, such as the large fern from AK. This one is easier to assemble and paint in individual layers of sorts, working our way towards the top. I'm glad I was finally able to use the fern in its entirety. In all my previous dioramas, I only used the individual branches because the whole thing is just so massive. Well, the final balancing act in this scene was adding some algae on the rocks and creek bed. Enamels are awesome for this, although clicks would work just as well. So yeah, that's the scenery finished. The most enjoyable part was definitely the paper vegetation. That was just an awesome afternoon at the workbench. But before we finish it off with resin water, we need to paint the turret. It also received a coat of dark primer, but black instead of brown. Black just works better on models because the shadows it creates are much deeper. I also use it on figures, but we'll get to that later. What you're about to see is just a recap of the same techniques I used on the Valentine Mark 9 I recently finished. So if you want to see cool weathering techniques on a larger surface than a discarded turret, I highly recommend that video. The biggest difference between that model and this one is the base color. Instead of the historically accurate British SCC dark brown, I used Soviet 4BO. Why? Well, I didn't want to paint the same finish twice in a row, and I thought a green turret would fit nicely into the vignette. Color composition is also a very important part of the creative workflow. For example, when I finished the Valentine in a brown finish, I gave it an autumn-themed diorama, which nicely complemented its color palette. So yeah, that was my standard post-shading approach, although not very historically accurate. But hey, at least I painted the inside of the hatch with the original brown color, right? Okay, and unlike the previous model, I'll weather this one completely with oil paints. Just for fun, you know, and because most of this is gonna be a recap of the same techniques on pretty much the same subject as I did two videos ago, I'll talk you through it really fast, except those parts which I did differently. So the pin wash was the same thing, just done with oil paints instead of enamels. What I did differently were the dirt accumulations and enhanced shadows. I was quite restrained on the Valentine because it was an operational tank, 
but here I was quite generous with the application. My aim was to simulate dirt, grime and maybe even soot from fire if the turret was blown off into the creek. It was a quick and efficient way of enhancing the post shading. Now I switched to acrylics for a moment and highlighted every small surface detail. This also enhances the post shading and in fact I dare to say it works as a system of techniques because they all complement each other. Still working with acrylics I initiated the chipping process by painting all exposed areas in a grey color. Chipping was carried out with red brown, a very nice universal rusty steel tone that contrasts nicely with pretty much any color scheme. Of course I applied it quite heavily because I wanted to add a lot of rust with oil paints. I wouldn't paint so many chips on an operational tank, but because I was only working with one small turret, the entire process was finished pretty quickly. Turning back to oil paints, I had a ton of fun with different intensities and shades of rust. Light orange tones were mostly applied over the grey areas, while the chipping received a layer of dark rust with some bright, fresh spots here and there. The advantage of this abandoned finish is that I could paint large rust accumulations over the entire surface, not just the chipped areas, and here I tried to follow the angle of the turret as it sits in the creek, so most of the rust was blended towards the lower edge. A very specific detail is the water line. I made a simple jig from styrofoam that allowed me to trace a perfectly straight line over the complex surface of the turret. It looks quite weird when I'm holding it in my hand, but yep, it's because the turret isn't laying perfectly flat on the ground. I created all of that with dust colored oil paint, but I wanted to take it one step further, so I added another layer with a fresh rust tone. This one was applied more sparingly and it nicely mixed together with the dusty layer. So that's the finished turret. Nothing fancy, but then again it has every telltale effect you might expect on a destroyed tank. And this is how it looks sitting in the vignette. And you probably already know what's gonna be the next step, right? Resin water. Well, there's a bit of preparation required before we can start pouring the resin. First of all, I need to glue the turret in place. Steel water is best for the job because it also seals the terrain underneath and dries to a crystal clear finish. Spreading the acrylic water over the entire creek bed is good practice because the porous finish of the groundwork would cause two major issues. The resin would seep into the base, lowering the water level, and it might cause streams of small air bubbles coming out of the base. A thick layer of steel water takes a while to dry, so in the meantime I 3D printed a bunch of perch fish that I found on Thingiverse. Painting 3D printed miniatures that are so tiny isn't as easy because my printer isn't ideal for organic shapes due to its visible layering. But hey, considering they'll be submerged in murky water, I think it's gonna be all just fine. I suspended them on clear rods, which I stretched from a leftover clear sprue and glued them into holes that were quickly punched into the ground with a needle. Now I need to create an improvised dam from Tamiya masking tape. Oval or circular bases are much easier to tape off because they don't have any sharp edges, but after a bit of prodding and additional armor made from thick double-sided tape, the dam traces the shape of the base pretty well. To avoid any leakage, I always make sure to brush a thin layer of steel water against the tape. It has a higher viscosity, so the chances it might run under the tape are almost zero. And now for the epoxy resin. As always, I'm going with the tried and tested resin from AK. It has to be mixed in a 2 to 1 ratio, and for this project, I went with 20 milliliters of resin and 10 milliliters of hardener. I tried a different approach though, one I saw in a book from AK, and it's all about tinting the first component with paint and then adding the hardener. I wanted to try if it has any advantages over mixing the resin first and then adding the paint, and as far as my observations go, there was no difference. However, someone with limited resin experience, such as me, can make a mistake with this approach. You see, when you're mixing clear resin, it's quite easy to distinguish the individual components because the hardener is not crystal clear. Once you can't see it anymore, you know the resin is well mixed. 
but because I was mixing tinted resin, I couldn't tell if I did enough mixing and quite frankly, the thought didn't even cross my mind. So once I was done, I've put an improvised trash can dust cover over it and left the resin to dry overnight, as usual. I already know that 12 hours is just enough to get a rock hard resin, but not this time. It was still viscous and it didn't get much harder after 24, not even 36 hours, my friends. Well, it did for the most part. You see, the culprit was my insufficient mixing of both components, and what happened was that the majority of it hardened without issues, but the hard resin dropped towards the bottom, while simultaneously pushing the uncured resin to the top. So when I decided to just screw it and remove the tape, the raised, uncured resin at the edges was ripped off. Something I'd have to do with the hobby blade if it cured properly. The surface was still tacky and the only solution I could think of was covering the whole thing with still water or water gel. Just something that would dry on top of it and water gel was the best bet because I'd use it even if the resin dried properly. See this hole right here? That's cured resin surrounded by soft resin. Nasty stuff. Well, once the first layer of gel dried, it gave me a decent surface to work with. I added the water ripples in two layers because I wanted to achieve as much texture as possible. You have to work swiftly because the gel starts to dry very fast when it's applied in thin layers, but the results are also quick and very satisfying. This is an amazing product and you can create so many exciting textures with it. For example, here I'm adding a different wave pattern because this is where the water hits the rocks. I improved this area even further with water gel effects and the name of this thing is slightly confusing, but basically it's just water foam. I really enjoy working with all these dedicated water products. It makes an intimidating task rather straightforward unless you're a dunce and you mix your resin incorrectly. <laughs> Affiliate link in description. <laughs> Anyways, I added a few floating leaves, mainly to hide those areas where the resin crept up on the turret. And that was basically it. Let's quickly finish the figure and you might have guessed it, I did it all with my favorite pre-shading slash glazing method. I made a very detailed video about the whole process a couple of years ago and I've been doing it the same way ever since, trying to sharpen my skills with a technique that works best for me. The results are just good enough for my purposes and what's best, they're predictable and that means no nasty surprises down the road. So yeah, now I just had to superglue the commander to his honorable spot behind the fern and the vignette was finished. Well, my friends, where should I start now? <laughs> Small vignettes made from leftovers, or as some modelers call them, palette cleanser projects, have the highest effort to fun ratio. You're using something that's of low value, a remnant of an epic project, and you're just having a good time. That's why I wasn't bothered with historical accuracy or any accuracy. <laughs> I received a question on Patreon about the turret, for example. Was it ripped off by an explosion? Then where was the impact? You know, legit questions, but I just didn't have an answer. I just went with old rusty turret sitting in water and that was that. <laughs> this whole scene was partially inspired by a very similar vignette made by Ruben Gonzalez and you can read about it in his FAQ dioramas book about ice, water and snow. He used a rusty Sherman to it, there's a creek and a tall tree trunk. He also added fish and an otter standing on the turret. His vignette is called Good Fishing, mine is Gone Fishing. The otter is doing the fishing in his scene and in mine it's the turret who's the fisherman. <laughs> but don't get me wrong, I'm not making excuses or anything. I was inspired and wanted to make a turret in a creek for a while so I'm giving credit where credit is due. My greatest disappointment with this project was the epoxy resin. Something I was looking forward to so much, but it was my haste and lack of brain cells that caused such an unpleasant problem. Next time I'm mixing the resin for 5 minutes straight and adding the paint afterwards. 
Anyway, in other news, this month is gonna be special for me because I'm going on vacation for the first time in 10 years. I'll be gone for a week, but before I board the plane, I'd like to make one more video for you. The next subject is gonna be modern. Very modern, in fact. And I can't wait to start the assembly. In the meantime, I want to sincerely thank every single one of you for watching these videos. Because if it wasn't for you, there would be no night shift who's building models for a living. It's something I'll be forever grateful for. This endeavor is also made possible by my incredible, generous patrons. My whole Patreon page is basically a Night Shift magazine subscription, as I post there almost every day with updates from my workbench. But we can also get in touch through DMs, comments and emails. I'm posting one week early ad-free videos and those stay there forever so you can always get back to them without even keeping track of these official uploads on my channel. I also have some extra goodies such as 3D models which you can download and print for your projects, a bunch of real life references for nature, old buildings and so on. And last but not least, these high resolution studio photos which show the model in more detail than video ever could. It will help me a lot, but hey, no pressure. Anyway, my friends, this is the second small vignette I did this year, and despite the bumpy road that led to the finish line, I still have fond memories of it. I consider myself more of a modeler than a collector, so what I value the most is the creative experience while I'm working on the project. But hey, it looks good in my display cabinet. <laughs> I'm gonna crack open that brand new modern German APC that landed on my doorstep today and you all stay safe, stay awesome, build your models, don't just collect them and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers!